This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. Hi everyone, Evan here, and thanks for listening today. I'm going to pass things right over to Miroslav Wolf for some additional thoughts on what needs to be said and done in this moment. What you need to know now is that we'll be posting more episodes this week than usual as we focus on the Black experience of racism, police brutality, and structural injustice. We'll be joined by Willie Jennings of Yale and Carrie Day of Princeton Theological Seminary. So stay tuned, and here's Miroslav. Friends and listeners, in our most recent episode of the podcast, I addressed very briefly the suffering of African Americans under unabating racism, most recently exemplified in the killing of Ahmaud Arbery and the death of George Floyd, caused directly by police brutality. I spoke from the perspective I developed in my book, Exclusion and Embrace. I spoke about forms of exclusion involved in racism. I called for solidarity with those who suffer under its brutal daily burden. I spoke also about the importance of the will to embrace the other. Importance of not closing ourselves into pure identities that are either indifferent or bellicose. In the seven minutes that I spoke, I left many important things about exclusion unsaid, both more generally, but also about its more specific expression in racism, especially racism in this country. But it is not just that important content or ideas about racism today was missing. Even more importantly, an indispensable perspective, of course, was missing. I spoke as a third party, a person moved by the suffering, by this dehumanization of others, but still as an observer. Now, those of you who are familiar with exclusion and embrace, you will know that I wrote the book from the perspective of victims from the perspective of victims' struggle for truth and justice and against the spirit of exclusion. Victims struggle for the will to embrace, that will to be born in them, and for them to embark upon a difficult journey of embrace. And to do so, even under situations in which every fiber of their bodies and all the steerings of their souls want to counter violence with violence, and exclusion with exclusion. I could write about the call of Christ crucified and resurrected to the victims, partly because I belong to a victimized group myself. My home country, Croatia, was partly occupied. The town in which I was born was for months under siege and exposed to shelling. My people were being driven out of their home. Even more importantly, I could write in this way because I wrote the entire book primarily for myself. Its many pages are one lengthy attempt to discern what the integrity of the Christian response looks like when a third of your country gets occupied and thousands of its inhabitants get ethnically cleansed and many of them killed. In some way, I was also trying to give myself reasons to do what in the depth of my soul, in the depth that remained undisturbed by my pain, by my rage, what in the depth of my soul I knew needed to be done, and what I believed and what I still believed needed to be done was to make a costly journey into what Martin Luther King called the beloved community. In the racial tensions in the United States, I do not belong to the victimized group. Instead, I belong to the privileged group that has, since the beginning of the European colonial project, benefited in many ways from the centuries of racial oppression. The fact that I am a naturalized U.S. citizen and therefore innocent of the centuries of oppression of the blacks in this country, makes little difference. My whiteness is my privilege. The fact that I came from the part of Europe 
that did not do the colonizing, but that was itself the object of centuries of colonization by Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires, that too makes little difference. In this country, my whiteness is still my privilege. Before speaking about victims and two victims, I need to listen. We all who are not victims need to listen. One of the points I make in Exclusion and Embrace is that in encounters with others, a posture of non-understanding is necessary. Seems paradoxical, but it's true. If I think that I already understand the other and their behavior, I have intellectually closed myself to them and my image of them has become unresponsive to who they are and to who they want to tell me that they are. I am then ready to judge, to declare their behavior either as good or bad, to condemn or to praise it. My presumed understanding can easily then become a form of closing myself off to them, even a form of exclusion. Then even in my attempt to embrace them, I may actually exclude them because I do not understand them as they understand themselves. Even in my attempt to be in solidarity with them, I can actually betray them because I am not in solidarity with them as they understand solidarity and themselves in the need of solidarity. For this reason, my posture should not be one of offering perspectives on how they should engage in the struggle against injustice, deception, and violence to which they are exposed. Since producing our recent episode last week, the situation has escalated. Protests and demonstrations, some of them violent, have spread across the country. We also failed to speak the name of Breonna Taylor, a black woman who was killed by police in her Louisville, Kentucky home in March. These realities require faithful and courageous Christian response, much needed exercise in public theology. So in the coming days, we will host on this podcast some of our African-American friends. Willie Jennings, my colleague at Yale and a leading theological voice in this country, will return to our podcast to offer his own commentary on our situation. We will also bring a conversation with Kerry Day, professor of constructive theology and African-American religion in Princeton Theological Seminary. Importantly, she was the main author of Princeton's Seminary and Slavery Report. I invite you to take time to listen and open yourself up for what they have to say. Thank you for listening, friends. We look forward to sharing these resources with you in the coming days. For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. For more information, visit faith.yale.edu. Thanks for listening.